Um, I'm delighted, really delighted, to welcome so many of you joining us in person and online together this afternoon at the Nuffield Foundation. I'm Anna Thomas, co-founder and director of the Institute for the Future of Work, an independent research and development institute exploring how new technologies are transforming work and working lives. We're here today to officially launch the Pisarides Review into the Future of Work and Wellbeing, led by our co-founder, Sir Chris Pisarides, with an amazing team of interdisciplinary experts from the Warwick Business School and Imperial College London. It's been brought to life with the hugely generous support of the Nuffield Foundation, who are also hosting our launch today. Thank you from all of us. This is a three-year project which will research the impacts of automation on work and workers, society and the economy. I just wanted to say a very few words first about why this project is so important at this time, not just for the Institute for the Future of Work and the team, but we think for individual and collective well-being at a critical point in time. Work is at the centre of people's lives and well-being. It's the thread that connects our everyday experience with local communities, the state and markets, public policy and private investment. And we're living through a new transformation of work. This transformation of work is multidimensional and its scope is huge. This means that the opportunities to create and shape better work across the country are huge too. But so are the risks to work and well-being for people if we don't get it right. Given so, there's remarkably little hard evidence about exactly how automation technologies are changing the nature, the quality and models for work, even the economy that creates it, and what this means for well-being at different levels. The Pissarides Review will be answering exactly this question, and we are reframing an, an, uh, automation, contemporary automation to extend to these wider impacts. The Institute for the Future of Work and our project team, skillfully managed by Dora Mer Meredith, works at the intersection of policy, civil society, academia and industry to translate these insights into action. Even better, we're examining these questions at just the time when there's a wider interest in both the significance of technology as a driver of change and the significance of the role of work for well-being and human flourishing. In terms of this evening, I'm going to hand over in a minute to Mark Franks from the Nuffield Foundation, and then Sir Chris Pissarides will provide an overview of the project and our early insights, before Isabel Berwick, Work and Careers Editor from the Financial Teams, and a member of the Review Steering Group will chair a panel discussion on some of the key themes that the Review will be exploring in more depth over the coming years. When it comes to the Q&A that follows the panel, we'll be taking questions from the in-person and uh, uh, online audience together. Please make it clear if you'd like to ask a question by either raising your real or your virtual hand. For our online audience, when the chair invites you to ask your question, you'll be promoted to the presentation screen, um, which can be audio if you prefer to have your camera off. Um, the technical side um, of the event is being supported by Jacobs Massey, and if you have any technical questions um, over the evening, please message the Zoom host. Uh, please note too that the event will be recorded, and we'll be sharing the recording via our website and social media channels. On that, if you are on social media, I encourage you to share your thoughts on this evening's discussion using the hashtag Pissarides Review. Last bits of housekeeping before we begin. In the unlikely events that a fire alarm sounds, those of you attending in person will need to evacuate the building via the two main stairwells located on either side of the lifts. Please don't use the lifts or collect your personal belongings. The assembly point is located outside 68 St John Street, which is to your left as you exit the building. Um, and on that note, I'm delighted to hand over to Mark Franks. Uh, well, thank you very much, Anna. It's, uh, it's just so fantastic to be here in a room uh, with people. And, uh, and I'll, I'll be saying a little about, about that in a moment. But I just wanted to make a few introductory remarks on behalf of the Nuffield Foundation. So we're an independent charitable trust with a mission to advance social well-being, and we fund and support vigorous research and analysis, which has the potential to change people's lives for the better. 
And we want the research we fund to ensure the development of economic and social policies underpinned by robust evidence. For that to happen, there needs to be engagement between researchers from different academic disciplines and between researchers and people working in policy and professional practice so that each can learn from the other's experience. Helping to facilitate that engagement is a core part of what we at the Nuffield Foundation do. And of course, over the last two years, the nature of such engagement has changed dramatically, at least in the sense of face-to-face -face interaction. Nevertheless, we've retained our belief that bringing people together physically as well as intellectually aids the collaboration and dialogue that can build new connections between people and drive positive change. And it's on that basis that we're delighted to host our first major event at the Nuffield Foundation's New Farringdon Home. Therefore, I'm delighted to be invited to be uh, welcoming those of you in the room today. And I'd also like to welcome everyone attending online, and I hope to meet many of you at events at the Foundation in the years to come. But I should move on to the substance of why we're here today. So we're thrilled to be supporting the Institute for the Future of Work in taking forward the Pissimedes Review uh, into the Future of Work and Wellbeing, and the review is addressing themes and challenges that are central to the Foundation's mission. Anna and Chris are better placed to speak uh, about that project than me. But I did want to say a few words about why we at the Foundation see it as such an important area for research. It almost goes without saying that work is fundamental to well-being, both as a source of financial security, but also for many people in providing an enhanced sense of belonging and purpose. Furthermore, many of us spend a large proportion of our waking hours at work, either, either physically or at home at work these days, so it's unsurprising that it has major implications for our physical and mental health and for our family lives. From the perspective of a research organisation, our interests are perhaps best expressed as a theory of change. So we first need to understand how technology and automation are changing worker wellbeing and its distribution across different groups. We then need to translate this into understanding into so far unanswered but yet researchable questions and to consider which research methods could address those gaps. It's then our role to stimulate and support such research and just as important to ensure the output is both useful and used. So that's relatively simple in the abstract, but hugely complex in practice, not least because advances in digital technology may impact employment outcomes in different ways. First, automation will reduce the number of jobs available in some sectors, such as autonomous vehicles, reducing the need for train or bus drivers, or computer systems providing simple news reports that previously would have been written by journalists. Second, other technologies may increase the quality or volume of work a person can do, or reduce the number of people needed to do it, such as automating, automating aspects of warehouse work or use of risk assessment tools in social care. And third, changes in technology can also allow people to carry out new tasks, such as new diagnostic tools for medical professionals or the ability to analyse vast quantities of data in ways that wouldn't have previously been possible. Actually, it's more complicated than I've just described because the three categories of technological change I mentioned will often overlap. Automating warehouse work might lead to both employment of few warehouse workers and also allow those who remain to work more efficiently or in better conditions. Advances in technology may also lead to increased demand for employees. The availability of new tools to carry out data analysis, for example, has not led to a fall in, a data, in demand for data scientists, for better or for worse. Uh, so even analysing the effects of changes in technology on the stuff that labour economists traditionally tend to care about, employment, wages, productivity, is far from straightforward. And actually, that's a heavily abridged list of what labour economists care about, but uh, I only have a few minutes left, so uh, I'll carry on. My point is that this project will go well beyond the most obvious economic metrics to consider the implications of health, well-being and capabilities of people at work. And right now, those are exactly the right questions to be asking, and the process of answering them is enriched by a multidisciplinary approach. We live in a time when increasing numbers of people are subject to many different types of worker monitoring technologies that, for instance, allow tracking of precise movements, keystrokes and facial expressions. Increasingly for some, management is outsourced to digital platforms which are often subject to substantial uh, and sudden changes in how people are paid or employed. 
The ways in which people communicate with colleagues and customers has in many ways undergone fundamental change. Potentially life-changing decisions about who to hire and who to promote are assisted by algorithms rather than relying solely on human judgment. Now that last example, for example, could have positive effects. It leads to reduced discrimination, for example, potentially. But history tells us that it would be wrong to decry all change as a bad thing. But it also tells us that the costs and benefits of change are rarely shared equitably. Which leads me to comment briefly on the topic of levelling up. We have as a foundation recently spent considerable time considering spatial inequalities and what they mean both for the types of research we should be supporting and how the outputs from that research should be used. We'll have more to say on that later in the year. However, one thing already apparent is that it's at the intersection of inequalities, according to gender, ethnicity, disability and social background, as well as geography, where our work can add the most value. And the workplace is one location where those factors do intersect. Yet the simple fact is that we don't yet, yet know nearly enough about the implications of fundamental changes in people's lives and livelihoods we see all around us, let alone how individuals, employers and policymakers should respond to them. By the end of this project, we will know more. And that's why the Pissarides Review aligns so well with the Nuffield Foundation's aims and why we are so proud to be supporting it. So thank you for listening, and I'll now hand over to Chris. Okay, thank you very, very much, Mark, for those uh, remarks. I need to have something to change. Is that it? To change the slides. Thank you. Slides. What slides? <laughs> what are they? Okay. So. Um, I, I've already learned something about our review today. I now have a hashtag. <laughs> Fame at last. I never had one before. But uh, I was very jealous last week when I read that uh, David Beckham has 70 million followers on his hashtag. So when you go home, you know what to do. <laughs> hashtag, please read this review. <laughs> Maybe a few times each we'll get there. <laughs> Uh, what I'm going to do uh, today is to um, give you an outline of, um, of the review that we're going to do. All the team is, uh, is sitting here. And um, what we, uh, at least <laughs> what I think we should be looking at and, uh, and what we've done so far and what methods we're going to use. And I look forward to hearing uh, your comments about everything there. I'm afraid these slides are a little bit wordy and I have 15 minutes to, to finish. So my advice is either read them or listen to me, but not both. <laughs> if I had to uh, recommend one of the two is listen to me, of course, by <laughs> putting a hashtag in front when you listen. <laughs> um, so, um, well, what we know is that um, uh, automation technologies are um, change. Actually, I can see that it's much easier. Automation technologies are transforming work uh, throughout UK society and even more so outside. You know, the, the, the countries with the biggest transformations are um, like the United States, China, them. And um, what, we, um, what we are seeing, or at least we, what we saw during the pandemic, was that all the research in new technologies and the way that it was directed, it was directed towards that one aim, you know, how, how can we keep the economy active when we have uh, um, this new problem, which is that if you get close to someone else, you might impose some costs on you, you know, if the economy, thinking, thinking as an economist was different about COVID, and it is a proximity to another human being. Uh, it could be quite costly, which wasn't um, before. Now, that's, that's all very good, but um, what we are seeing at the same time, and the reason I think that I think that research in uh, automation and how we apply it, is that there's been a lot of growth in poor quality work. Uh, there's a lot of insecurity, you know, think of gig economy. Um, autonomy is completely absent. There isn't much uh, uh, exchange of ideas at different levels of the company. And of course, inequality has been going up and we have a review of the rise of inequality in the UK. Um, coordinated by Angus Deaton. Um, so so what, what do we do? Well, 
the most important thing we have to um, uh, understand about new technologies is that digital technologies is that they are very very different from the very big ideas of the past. So if you go back to the beginning of the industrial revolution and you ask what are the important technologies we've had, you would say well the steam engine, um, railways, the internal combustion engine, electricity, uh, and so forth. Those, these are the very big ones. With those, as I say, using my favorite Americanism, I don't have many favorite Americanism, but this is one of them. He said, no, the, those are no-brainer, no-brainer technologies. You know what you have to do. You know, when the internal combustion engine came, it completely killed the horse breeding profession. But no one complained about it because, you know, it would carry things around, you know, the model car and, um, and, and much more efficiently than, uh, th than horses. When electricity came, then you knew that you could replace the steam engine or, or even some of the internal combustion engines and, and you would be increasing your productivity and that uh, opened up the whole manufacturing to all those consumer uh, durables that, uh, that have driven economic growth during the 20th century that uh, Bob Gordon is saying, you know, his, well, his famous book, I would say, uh, I would think that he's saying that um, uh, it will never happen again. So forget the happy times that we enjoyed in the 20th century. And, and now hard the times come, are coming along. And I guess, I, I guess he was right in that what we have now are digital technologies where we have a choice how to apply them and they could be misapplied. They affect an awful lot of things. They could um, replace jobs without any second thought or without taking into account uh, the impact on the workers. They could redesign the place of, of work so that it makes it more worker friendly. They could engage other um, stakeholders in the, we could engage other stakeholders in work and say what they want and so on, you know, new business models. We see some of those emerging and the um, management literature is already uh, writing about that. Uh, but, um, but that's where we are. And I, I don't think we had a full uh, study of um, exactly how can we use uh, the new technology for uh, the betterment of, um, of humankind, which is what uh, our objective is going to be here. Um, we, um, Obviously, I guess most people now, most companies would, would deny that they would use robots to replace labor. You still read about it occasionally from very large Chinese companies, I mean, like the most famous being Foxton that assembles uh, smartphones. Uh, they say all the assembly of smartphones will be done by robots now because they didn't like the labor relations they had before, you know, that kind of idea. Um, I think here it, it's more like um, <clears throat> thinking how, can, how could we use uh, robots or other machines to do the boring work and and we involve our workers into more creativity and and more interesting work uh, and that's why we're putting well-being in our title that we our hope is that we're going to devise ways we're going to find ways <clears throat> that uh, that could be achieved without the firm going under because of uh, much increased costs and not um, uh, good quality products <clears throat> now <laughs> what I'm going to do next, maybe I should speed up a, a little bit with this, is to uh, say where where we see the, the, the British economy going now with new technologies, and then how we're going to research uh, this um, um, their their application here and how to improve the situation in the labour market. Now, the first trend is that um, is that technological progress as we've been having so far, is not leading to improvements in job quality. If you look at the happiness indices, are people satisfied? Do they get more job satisfaction than before? The answer is no. Um, in fact, work in the um, in happiness, I had a meeting with my old colleague Richard Lair last week, and he said to me, do not forget happiness. That's why that should be the number one objective of economists. And in fact, if you the, 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 the things that cause most un unhappiness actually of, uh, for working people, one is commuting. Commuting is by far the most unhappy activity of a working person. And, and, and the second is meeting the boss at work. 
<laughs> so, so obviously there hasn't been an improvement in job quality. Otherwise, why would you be scared to meet your boss? Um, then the um, adoption of automation, whatever we have, is, is not uniform across uh, space and across skills. Uh, labor market inequalities are growing. Um, the, um, the way inequalities are, grow are growing is quite interesting in that what we are finding is that, or what we know from the work of many other people as well, and, and especially the United States, which is, but it's also a feature of the UK, is that all the productivity gains since the financial crisis of 2008 went to the top 10% of the income distribution. All the others in the United States they are completely stationary. In the UK, there's been a little bit of, uh, of, of a rise in incomes. You know, it's what's known as the great stagnation, um, and that's what increases the, the, the labour market inequality. Now, uh, health outcomes are not very good because again, your health and, and your mental well-being depend on how happy you are at work, and um, location is beginning to be important. Productivities are very different across uh, space, and where you live is, is, is important again. And again, we should be doing something about that. Leveling up, as it's called. I have some comments about that actually later on. Um, all right, now there, there are slides that explain all these things, but I, I, I said more or less what, um, we, um, what we're thinking about. Actually, I, I'll talk about the main point here. The, the main point here is that the UK is very good at doing research. Excellent universities, excellent research establishments, very highly qualified people. But it's really terrible at applying the results of that research to production, to, to the market. And, um, and, and that's, um, that's a big puzzle. You know, the, where there's no human-centered uh, innovation, well, you know, by the time we get to human-centered innovation, we, we, uh, we'll be happy enough if we get some applications of, of, of UK discoveries. I, I, I asked many people, actually, about that. You know, wh why is the UK so good at um, producing new ideas, but uh, not very good at exploiting these new ideas? And, and, and they're always hesitating. I don't think I've heard any convincing answer as to why that's the case. Um, so... Um, so we're going to investigate that. Even, um, even in government departments, once we went to, um, was it BASE that we went to find out? It was, I, I don't know, they keep changing the name of that department. So I feel that. And, um, and they were saying how good the UK is in innovation and everything, but then they were talking about discovery, not, not in application. And it's true that discovery is, I mean, you know, you have great institutions like the London School of Economics and the IFOW, among some other universities, I guess. Um, now, the adoption of automation is uneven across the country. We know that, that give, that's what gives rise to, um, to inequalities. And, and also, actually, I should say that with the growth of manufacturing, which is what happened in the 20th century, there was a lot of trickle down of, uh, of, of the benefits of the higher productivity. Uh, because everyone was in factories, there was a good union organization. Um, and um, and uh, was it Henry Ford or A. Ford? Not, what was the name of the president? Was it John Ford? I don't want, yeah, Henry Ford. Yeah, he, he could see his workers there and he wanted them to be happy working for him. And that's why wages went down. But it, it, in the current situation with digital technologies, that's not happening. It's what I explained before that, um, <coughs> Gerald's fault, actually, you're right. <laughs> that um, it, it's, um, it, well, there's no union organization, workers are not organized, there is no uh, collecting, there are no collecting bargaining agreements, they are not protected by the law, except for the minimum wage, which is, a, which is a, an excellent thing to have, in fact, I should say. Um, but the result is that any uh, increases in pay beyond the minimum wage, it just, they, they don't go to the low incomes, they go to the higher incomes. And that's the uh, problem with that. It's quite, um, it's quite interesting, actually, the unions of this, seeing, seeing people's, people's attitude to, uh, to trade unions, that um, if things don't go well with the workers, they're saying, oh, it's because we unions weakened, and in those days they have strong unions. If, if there is inflation in the country, or if wages are going up, oh, it's because unions are so aggressive. <laughs> I mean, like, you, 
you, you blame unions if things go wrong in the labor market, and then um, you say if things don't go right in the labor market, it's because unions are not there. But I, I mean, I do think they, they have a very useful role to play to reduce inequality, actually, if not other things. Now, labor market inequalities are, are, are growing, of course, in the way, in the way I explained um, before. And um, we can leave that uh, there because I suspect we're running out of time, although I don't have a clock to look at. Um, work is a key to health outcomes, again, in not only in COVID uh, times, but other times in children's qualities. We'll talk about that at, the, at our panel discussion if you have any more uh, questions. And um, place increasingly defines our experience of work in that. Um, as what we call stubborn geographic inequalities that, uh, um, um, that are marked in whatever we do. Someone is someone trying to switch me off. I know, sorry, I can only see if there is no here. Um, I, I, should, I should make some remarks actually about leveling up because everyone, I, I think that's what, uh, that's the right place for it, yeah. Um, if, I mean, everyone is obviously fa in favor of leveling up because it reduces inequality. But it, it's, it's a very, very difficult problem, though, if you look at the, uh, where modern um, economic theory is going, at least uh, in uh, new economic geography and since uh, Krugman's, uh, Paul Krugman's great con contributions in the 1980s. The things that we know, uh, because of loads of work that uh, was taking place even before, but even after, Krugman uh, did one of those things that people outside economics find ridiculous, that he took some obvious ideas, he put them into equations, and he won the Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> but then he generated so much work that uh, we know so much more now about uh, uh, cities and uh, agglomeration externalities and all that. I mean, you, you know your economy, you want your economy to enjoy agglomeration externalities. We, we know that they exist. You get more productivity in bigger and more dense uh, cities. That's why th there, is, there is more technological innovation, more discoveries, more application if you exchange ideas. Of course, the best example is uh, Silicon Valley, the San Francisco area, Berkeley, Stanford combined, that, the, the, that whole big Bay area. Um, but also there's Massachusetts, there is uh, the West uh, Corridor of London, there is Cambridge in, in Britain. And it, it's impossible to, to enjoy that kind of um, uh, agglomeration by leveling up the whole country uh, at, that, uh, at that level, in the level of technology. You, you wouldn't want to spread your uh, best minds to do research in technology and, and who are, um, and, and who are in, inventing ways of implementing these new technologies across the country. At, at most, you might want to um, spread them out in uh, two or three major cities. But just think about it. The United States has two, basically, San Francisco and Massachusetts. Uh, China, with one point billion people, has uh, three. It's the Bay Area of uh, Shenzhen, um, Shanghai, when they're not locked up <laughs> uh, and, and not being able to interact, and, and, and the area around Beijing, maybe. But that's it. There's no other areas of agglomeration externalities. Um, and uh, smaller countries like uh, Sweden, even France, they basically have, have one. There is, there is Paris, there is Stockholm. That's it. So, so the reason I say it's, it's very difficult is that um, it's not obvious what you do with, to, to level up the, um, the areas of the country that are not enjoying those benefits compared with those that are enjoying their benefits. And, 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 and that's, very, that, that's very, very closely uh, connected with what we're doing, which uh, comes later. There you go. What, what I think the best approach is, is to uh, get rid of any barriers or frictions to uh, economic adjustment to these uh, um, cities that have the, uh, the advantage over the others for whatever historical reason. Um, 
So that's our work on, uh, on frictions and identifying the frictions through uh, surveys of uh, companies and, and people and finding out uh, if they feel uh, free to move or not move. Uh, all that. And once, once you do that, then you, you've done your bit for leveling up. That's the way to do it. Now, the, if you leave the economy alone, in a completely free economy, it, it is going to be concentrated in different parts of the country. London will always be higher tech than the rest of the country, in the way that Paris will always be higher tech in France than the rest of the country, or San Francisco in the United States. Um, so what do you do after that? Well, I think you do it through, through transfers, it, it, not, not sort of taxing London and giving money to the others, but through building really, really good infrastructure in the other areas. So you, so you improve well-being, make them happy, and uh, they, they have a service economy, basically, you know, good uh, digital um, infrastructure, uh, good broadband connections that they can work uh, remotely. And, um, and of course, that happens. You see, the United States probably do more of that than we do here because they have the federal government. The, 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 feder the, the west of the United States developed entirely through transfers from the east via the federal government, all the defense establishments in Arizona and California and all the canals in California to water the San Jose Valley and so on were built, they, they were direct transfers across the country. But that's my view now. Maybe I'll change my view when, uh, when we do the research and uh, they persuade me that this is not the right way to do it. Um, okay, so how are we going to do the work here? Well, we're going to construct the first national disruption index to um, map and track technological disruption across the UK. And we, we've, made, uh, we've made some progress, a lot, quite, some, quite a lot of progress, actually, on that. It's the first thing we started doing. Um, we're going to have a survey of firms that will be done by the Warwick Business School and James Hayton, and uh, that is uh, progressing well. The survey has been designed. I don't think we found this, uh, the company to do the survey yet, but we're looking. We're going to do a survey what's described there as deep, deep dive into where challenges and opportunities would be done under the direction of uh, Jordan Scordis, and they will be interviewed people now, not, uh, not company bosses like uh, the previous one, but um, more like workers, individuals um, in eight areas of the country. And finally, something that will come later, we haven't started it yet, we're going to um, have established networks for the dissemination of our work on, uh, on, on the future of work and, 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 and policy making. So here it is, it's a collaboration between the um, Foundation, obviously, Imperial College, with many thanks, <laughs> Imperial College London, WBS. You left out Imperial, actually, there, Imperial College London, too. We, we do have a team at Imperial College working on um, Internet of Things. Why are you looking at me like that? Have, you, have they left us? No, we're still connected. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe another thing I didn't know. <laughs> and here is the mighty team. You see most of them in real life here, actually. Um, should I stop here? I know there is a thank you there, so I... <laughs> if, how can we miss out the hashtag on that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I'm, I must have spoken. Um, thank you very much, Chris, for your early insights and explaining how we're going to be building on your prize-winning framework on frictions um, to um, carry out this frontier work, helping our understanding of automation and the impacts of work and well-being. I'm going to hand over to Isabel Berwick now, but as the panel assembles, we're going to play you a short video.
Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Chris, for that introduction. Um, hello, welcome to everyone here and everyone watching virtually. Uh, I'm Isabel Berwick, I'm the Work and Careers Editor at the FT, and I host our Working It podcast about future of work, so there we go. I've done loads of real life panels and I've done loads of hybrid panels, I mean virtual panels, but this is the first kind of properly hybrid panel that I've done. So I'm going to introduce my hybrid panelist first. She is Glenda Quintini who joins us remotely. She's Senior Economist for Skills and Employability at the OECD. Glenda, welcome. Oh, yeah, she's, she's... <clears throat> Chris, you've already heard from. So Chris Pisarides is founder and co-chair of the Institute for the Future of Work and is leading the review. He's also Regis Professor of Economics at the LSE and won the 2010 Nobel Prize in Economics. So I think you are the most distinguished panellist I've ever sat next to. Okay. Uh, Probably the only one with it. <laughs> 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 Professor Jolene Scordis is Deputy Director of UCL's Institute for Global Health and Director of its Centre for Global Health Economics. And on my far right, Heaton Shah is Chief Executive of the Brit British Academy a visiting professor at King's College London and deputy chair of the Ada Lovelace Institute. So welcome everybody. We're going to have a short discussion about uh, the themes of the review that we've covered so far. And we're going to leave loads of time for questions. So please have some, whether you're here or virtual. I'm going to start off with just quite a general question. So Chris touched on the history of technological transformation across the UK. But um, would the panel like to add other thoughts? Heaton, would you like to kick off on that one? Well, I think, um, as, as was sort of intimated before, it, t technological change has had disruption on the jobs that we have now. I mean, you know, we had a large agricultural sector, we don't anymore. Uh, so that leads us, I think, to think, how do we protect not jobs, but workers? I think, you know, that if you can frame it in that way, that's very important. I think the other thing to think about historically is what has been the role of social movements in providing the kind of protections that we've had uh, <laughs> to the shift. So this is not something that just happens to us, you know, that the role that trade unions have played, which we've discussed, but civil society more generally. I mean, if you look at the changes that have happened to working hours or to health and safety regulations, those haven't magically appeared from nowhere. Uh, and I think a, a kind of important question today is where, where are the sources of some of those social movements coming from? Jolene, is there anything to add to that? Uh, well, I, actually, I think what I might do, if you, uh, if you don't mind, is extend some of the thinking on inequalities and well-being, uh, because there's been a long study of health and the trajectories of health within the United Kingdom, and that has grown into a much richer understanding of of well-being and capabilities and happiness. Um, OECD has a happiness index. Uh, so so we, we've got a broader understanding of what it means to be healthful and to have well-being. Um, and we've looked, uh, there's some history of looking at intersectionalities with inequalities dating back to the Whitehall studies in the 60s, which showed that poverty and absolute and relative poverty links to poorer health outcomes, and I'm happy to say more about that. But what we haven't done yet is explicitly tie, outside of a occupational health environment, explicitly tie our working environment and workers to their home environments and their healthfulness or well-being in a broader context. I think that's what's really innovative about this study, is we, we're looking at really what the, the working environment and one sense of control and autonomy within work, how that might be affected by technologies and how that may have knock-on effects on uh, well-being for the population and, and the widening inequalities that we're already seeing, how those may be exacerbated. So I think it's an important time to be doing what we're doing. Definitely. I'm going to go to you, Glenda, to widen it out. How does the UK's tech transformation compare with that of other countries? And you might want to pick up some of the points that Jolene's just made as well. Can we hear you? No. Oh, no. Are you on mute? Oh, no. Glenda. Really? But she hasn't she has spoken yet. We heard you earlier. Can you speak? Let me see. Oh no. A hybrid panel has had a hitch. Mm. Automation. Yes. yes, the technology I'll that lets us down. I'll let, you, I'll let you speak to people behind the scenes. 
So I wanted to go on to some of the factors that are influencing the nature and pace of adoption of uh, the automation technologies we've talked about already, but particularly now after the pandemic. Keaton, would you like to kick off on that one? I mean, it's a massive topic. It's a massive topic and tricky. I mean, I suppose one kind of important context to all of this is uh, business investment in, in a kind of period of real uncertainty post-Brexit, uh, post the pandemic, now with Ukraine, etc. So uh, I think that, that that's one factor which is probably holding up uh, uh, some, some of the kind of uh, experience of automation. Uh, another issue is is how well it spreads. So, you know, we talked about locations and uh, agglomeration effects and so on. Because of the way that the UK is structured, I mean, that notion of the future is already here, but it's not evenly distributed, I think, is is a good way of thinking about it. A lot of the technology is already there, but where what is the adoption uh, across the UK? Uh, and then a final factor is labour market costs. So that, I think, is going to be a critical issue. In terms, so we're seeing shortages in certain areas, HEV drivers, certain kind of high-skilled occupations. And if you can't get the labour, then you're going to think, well, what else can we turn to? On the other hand, there are still areas where we have very cheap labour uh, and actually, you know, where the minimum wage may not be being enforced properly. You think of the kind of sweatshops in Leicester, which your colleague Sarah O'Connor has written about very eloquently. Uh, there's no point to uh, actually trying to automate in that space if you if you can go if you can pay below the floor. So I think those are all factors in in, in the kind of question. You know, ferries. Yeah. <laughs> Jolene, did you want to come in on this one? Well, yes, I, I, th I think there may be an opportunity. I'm, both Chris and, and Hitton have already talked about the opportunities that automation can offer us and how we can, we can orient our focus towards creating better work for workers as opposed to better jobs. Um, but I think what we might also want to think about is how this will push us to think about value. And, and, and the talking about minimum wage and global minimum wages, should we be thinking as a wider organisation, that's why I really hope we can bring in the OECD uh, shortly, but could we be thinking more widely about what we value as a society? So, so can we pass certain tasks on to automated technologies and better value caring roles, better value human contact? And those have historically been undervalued roles, disproportionately female roles. And so there's an opportunity and that they're also linked with health care and caring roles. So there's an opportunity here to redress some very long seated inequalities in the structure of our economies and our societies. Linda, are we can we hear from you? Yes, I think so. I was hit by the by the unmute course. And also now I'm able to unmute myself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean um, uh, congratulations on the project. I think what uh, Chris was introducing as uh, issues that, of course, apply across uh, um, all uh, OECD countries. And at the OECD, we spent quite a bit of time looking at the implications, particularly as far as I'm concerned, or through, through the lens of skills and employability, um, particularly the implications for workers, uh, the implications for the tasks uh, that they need to accomplish at work. And there, I would say the UK is rather below the OECD average. So, so the, if we try to quantify, which is what people often call us for, to benchmark countries and compare them, um, in the UK, we estimate that about 12% of jobs will be very affected in the sense that there's many tasks in those jobs that are affected by uh, digitalization, by automation, and another 25% have a large share, but not all the, not the, the vast majority of tasks. So what I take home from this is not necessarily massive job destruction, uh, but it still means uh, that all those workers will need to work with uh, uh, new technologies. That some of the tasks that are automated will be replaced by new tasks that they're not necessarily familiar with. Uh, which means, again, that they need to retrain, to upskill and reskill. So for me, one of the elements you were asking before, you know, you want to add anything. One of the elements that was not mentioned so much was really adult learning, because I'm bringing it close to home, because that's specifically what I, I, I work on, skills and adult learning. But I think that that dimension of the transition of the automation is going to be major if we want to make sure 
uh, that the benefits are felt uh, across uh, because there is, as many have said already, a very strong in a, uh, an equal dimension in how automation is affecting uh, the labour market. Thank you. I'm so pleased you're with us. Chris, I wanted to come to you finally, sorry. Mm. Um, what are some of the impacts of tech transformation on work across the UK? What are we seeing already? Well, actually, we, we, we're not seeing very much yet because there hasn't been um, much uh, application on, on a large scale. And um, I don't think we're seeing, I guess, the greatest impact we're seeing is, is one that COVID pushed us in the direction to, which is uh, remote working and um, you know, having hybrid meetings now is, is, is standard. We have webinars instead of seminars, you know, meet remote meetings like, uh, um, you know, medical consultations are all done by the telephone. That's the main impact that we've seen so far. I don't think we've seen, like, I think Glenda reflects on that as well. Like we, we haven't seen any massive dismissals of, uh, of workers because of automation. In fact, even what we're seeing because of other, structure, other reasons for structural change in the economy, you like p and for, for example, is because travel, that form of travel is down. It is down. You know, and again, it's COVID induced because the, the first big problems with COVID, if you remember, were in cruise ships. <laughs> so everyone yes. got that scared of boarding a, a ship to go anywhere. Um, the, um, and, and I think that's why it's a good time to be doing this uh, project because we could actually influence and it's not that everything has been done and uh, well you know you've come in too late thank you very much <laughs> we bear it in mind kind of thing you know it's uh, it, it's something that, that could be could be done i i i think you see to, to stop this kind of um uh, of of work at dismissal and uh and, and move more in the direction that uh, both Hilton and, and Jolene were saying. Um, I, I think we do need government uh, help, you know, government incentives there. You, you see, ultimately, what um, business bosses boast about is when their share value is going up. And despite everything they're saying that, they, you know, they have stakeholders beyond shareholders and all that, they, the, the ultimate objective is to make as much money as possible so that you can get as big a bonus as possible and, um, and you're happy at the top end of the income distribution in the company. Um, so here I, I was completely sold on that by, by the book of my old friend, um, don't tell me I've forgotten the name of my friend, I, I knew I was going to mention him, so I was trying to remember what his name is in case I forget it. <laughs> Prosperity is called. You must know because he won the FT Book of the Year. Oh, God. No. <laughs> uh <-huh. Prosperity. laughs> yes. Share the embarrassment. Yeah, sorry. It's going to come to me when someone else is speaking. Yeah, me too. And I'm, and I'm going to interrupt. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go. Shall I go to Heaton and, and we can... Uh... I'm back to you. Oh, you don't want to hear about what I was sold by reading Yeah, go book. on then. Yes. It's so rare to read a book. You know, the Financial Times asks me every year, what interesting books did you read in the previous year? And it's so embarrassing. I pretend that the email goes into junk because yeah. I don't read anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, 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 it is that... Um, oh, exactly, there you, you see? Thank I knew it. <laughs> I knew someone would know. I didn't know it. Colin Mayer. I bet you checked on. I bet you checked on your phone. That's why it took you so long to come up with the name. Yes, you see. <laughs> anyway, Colin Mayer from Oxford Business School. And and what what he was saying is that um, companies should state other objectives than uh, maximizing value when when they're incorporated, and and then they should be uh, tested against those. They should be held liable if they don't meet them. And obviously, if the government comes in and says you haven't um, fulfilled your, the, the purpose that you said you were going to when you established this company in this community, then obviously share value is not going to go up because they're going to say, yeah, the regulator is coming and is stirring them up and, uh, and, and share value will come down. So that, that might be a way to yeah. push them in. I think Glenda has 
Glenda wants to support what I just said. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, no, I want uh, I, I, I agree with you. There needs to be some uh, uh, intervention. Oh, what I wanted to say is going back a little bit to how companies can help, right? So uh, if they are introducing new technologies, uh, uh, they need people who can work with those technologies. So uh, maybe their current workforce uh, comes. So we're not talking for the majority of technologies and we're talking to many technology experts these days. We're not talking about technologies that are going to automate everything, but rather that are going to, that workers will need to work with. And what we find when we ask, uh, we've done quite a bit of case studies with firms, when we ask them uh, why they don't train, for example, workers that are, uh, who are low skilled and who are more likely to be affected by technological change, uh, some of the difficulties they mention are quite interesting in terms of getting ideas for policy action. Very often they find it difficult to um, replace workers while they're away on training, and it's uh, for them uh, what we've understood again from these hundred case studies we've done is is a lot more difficult for uh, people on a production line, for example, because they work on a ship. Uh, so uh, it is aggravating the fact that a lot of training goes to high collar workers rather than blue collar workers uh, who are at higher risk. Because we know statistically, workers in jobs at higher risk of automation receive less training, and they're often blue collar workers. So. I think there is, I agree with, with Chris, a way that uh, uh, government can influence, um, uh, can help, uh, influence health employers to provide training that adapts the skills of their workers rather than generate mass dismissal and fire everybody and hire new workers entirely. Hmm. I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to ask you, Julian, about well-being, perhaps coming back to that. Sure. And on some of the points, what are the implications for well-being? So, uh, the concepts of well-being that, that have now been studied through long-running surveys like the ICE CAP, um, there's the OX CAP, so there's long-running surveys of capabilities that really build on Amartya Sen's original work, which says we need not only to look at what people can do, but what the potential is there for for them to do and and that links too with the work on happiness that that um, Britain and the and other countries in the OECD have done I think there's there's so many impacts for this because Chris's work on frictions I, mean, I suppose that the easiest way to explain it is the moment any one of us feels stuck feels trapped by our situation feels stuck on a production line and sees the risk to your job but sees no way of training your way out of that position of being stuck and in, into a new job, no way of moving to somewhere else where jobs might be. That sense of powerlessness, that sense of being stuck, that undermines your physical well-being, your mental health, but also your happiness, your sense of connection, your sense of autonomy and power and ability to control your life, which is fu quite fundamental to all of our sense of well-being. If you can ever reflect on a time where you felt out of control in your life, you'll know exactly what I mean. It's that feeling that undermines our well-being in a way that isn't traditionally captured by health indicators, but absolutely predicts your life expectancy. Um, so we can, we can link to harder measures like life, death, uh, wellness during life. But also, I think we're starting to develop a much more nuanced desire to understand the quality of life between life and death. And that's what this is also about. Mm. This is also about maximizing an equal sense of quality of life around our society and the importance of work within that. Within what we've been hearing from Chris, from Glenda, there, there is a sense of polarization that's happening. Skills transformation is being offered to higher paid workers who are already higher paid, less transformation to lower workers who are already lower paid. We're going to see growing inequalities. And actually, I can tell you the evidence tells us inequalities kill people. So being at the bottom end of an inequality spectrum is bad for your life expectancy, as well as for the quality of your life between life and death.
So uh, there, there are a lot of threads that we're picking up on this. We're developing a measure of capabilities specifically for the workplace, and we're going to, do, to be collecting what, what amounts to the first survey done in the United Kingdom on capabilities in work and for work, which will be interesting in its own right, as well as linking together these themes of, of automation and how it might support or undermine a sense of capabilities, depending on your exposure to frictions as Chris has developed it. So I, I hope that not very succinctly answers your question. It's fascinating. Hey, Tom, would you like to... Yeah, just a couple of other things yeah. which I think... I mean, what, what, one thing we, we've not yet talked about is the cost of living crisis. Yes. And this is good. I mean, if you're thinking about the future of work, yeah. am I paid a decent wage? It's got to be a critical question over the coming decade. I mean, if not the next sort of three or four years. Um, and that translates back to you've got to think about UK productivity which has just been shambolic, right? So over the last, since the financial crisis, it's been 0.4% productivity growth, whereas it used to be 2% before mm -hmm. that. So how we address that is a sort of significant question. Mm -hmm. And then that intersects with the inequalities, mm -hmm. I think, which is really tricky. And then the final twist in all of this is the kind of shape of the welfare state that we have, which is really just very, very weak in the UK. And if you look at mm -hmm. sickness pay, if you look at childcare, if you look at, um, uh, unemployment benefits, yeah. they are very, very weak when compared to the rest of the OECD, for example. So I sort of feel like we're coming to a crunch where actually if you have automation, if you have this kind of cost of living crisis mm -hmm. and not a strong welfare system, which provides that kind of flex security model that, you know, the Danish and others have got, yeah. it's going to create real problems, which we have not been thinking about because we've in some ways had, had a kind of benign period for some mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. all those stagnant wages. Mm. Chris, you want to come yeah, in? No, I, I mean, I agree entirely with that. I just want to add some, uh, something more about productivity. I mean, you're absolutely right that productivity is a, is a big, big puzzle. And for that reason, um, we have a productivity commission that is uh, coordinated by the um, National Institute of Economic Research. Unfortunately, the director couldn't be here. He sent me apologies. He had some health issue. And we've taken evidence from um, various experts in different fields about productivity. And, and the dominant view about why productivity in the UK is, is so low, has been so low since the financial crisis is, is precisely what I was saying before, that there is no, it's in TFP, there is no application of new technologies to get productivity out of your existing inputs. That any growth that we're seeing is coming from, say, more investment, maybe better infrastructure, but not, not new technologies. The UK hasn't been applying new technologies at work to get um, a rise in total factor productivity, which is what drives uh, productivity over, long, over the long term. So that's obviously what would be working a lot here to find out why. And I wanted to bring Glenda in here, perhaps to talk a little bit about um, some of the data that we're lacking or that we need that is going to be useful to policymakers and strategists. Perhaps could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one uh, one uh, one thing that I want to say is that we are uh, doing now this uh, very moment uh, a reassessment of the risk of automation that we computed a few years ago. So we are speaking to technology experts uh, to understand uh, uh, how the advances, in particular in AI, are changing those assessments done in the early 2000s about what might be the impact of automation on skills, on tasks, and as a result, to get a sense of how big uh, the issue might be in different countries. Um, I, I think uh, what we need, uh, though, to add uh, is a better understanding of the adoption of new technology. Chris mentioned it uh, uh, at the beginning, and I think you said you will be doing survey data, um, and we're, we're doing something similar as well, surveys with employers to understand uh, when, when, where these technologies are being adopted because there's a difference between the technological capabilities and the actual adoption at work and what matters for well-being for all the issues that we've been talking about is whether technologies are being adopted and, and the specific uh, implications. And then I think there's uh, another piece of data that was mentioned a little bit is better data on uh, shortages, uh, skill gaps, uh, uh, just to understand where the pressures are coming from. We still don't have a very good picture of that. There's a lot of articles in the news telling us, you know, there's recruitment difficulties, but those are not necessarily real shortages, but reflect bad jobs being advertised in some cases. So I think there's still a need 
to better understand that. So how we measure uh, shortages, where they're coming from, uh, and uh, and the result being able to to put in place policies that uh, that accompany technology, uh, that accompany workers uh, uh, to make sure they come out uh, as benefiting from technologies rather than being affected by them. Thanks, Glenda. I'm, I'm going to move on to the next question. Just ask Chris to kick us off on what are the, some of the ways that policymakers and others can respond to the challenges we're facing well, policymakers have an enormous role to play. I'm beginning with uh, inequality. Like I was saying before, you know, they have to find ways of, uh, um, say, taking the role of unions that were negotiating before for the uh, lower uh, paid. Um, I mean, it's good, you know, we shouldn't be criticizing everything they do. It's good that they do have a, a good minimum wage and that a lot of workers are enjoying uh, a reasonable standard of living, on, especially on the living wage, but also the minimum wage outside London is good enough. Um, in, in infrastructure is still very important, actually. I mean, like, like you might say, well, you know, here's another economist telling us about infrastructure. I mean, the, the nature of infrastructure changes, of course, all the time. Now it's mainly digital infrastructures and using um, artificial intelligence to uh, control, uh, say, traffic flow, trains running, um, electric uh, charge points for cars, uh, and so on. All, all that is part of the infra infrastructure that cities need now. And that would uh, obviously help enormously as well in doing it. And then, and then there is a the big question of uh, what incentives could um, government give to make sure that um, new technologies that we either discover here or that we know about from outside get applied in um, get applied in, in, in industry in Britain, which is uh, which is a puzzle in which we're going to study now. Um, I should say that one of my patients <laughs> saying that you know when when we were talking about Brexit, one of the uh, people that I respect the most in economics, in fact, he said, um, "Oh, you know, Brexit will be will be good in the UK because." At last, the best minds might decide to go into manufacturing and uh, other business that that really produce, <laughs> rather than uh, the financial sector, which is just playing zero-sum games with very, very added on value. I haven't seen it yet, but I haven't seen it yet. No. Does anyone else want to come in on that before we're going to move to questions? I think I'd just like to really re emphasise what you said, Hayton, in terms of the role of government as a provider of a floor, a stable floor to support those at the bottom of the, 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 the pay continuum, the power continuum. I think we do need to think about the role of social welfare um, a, as a protection mechanism in the event that firms' incentives ha leave workers out temporarily or, 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 or in a longer term of the labour market. Mm -hmm. So, I think Linda uh, wants to uh, I make a couple of points. One is at the kind of macro level, government can help shape the technolog technological mm. shifts that we're seeing. So for example, you know, there's a new high risk uh, R&D uh, uh, agency called ARIA uh, and government is kind of giving that 800 million over the next few years. If we gave it a mandate to think about pro-worker technology, uh, you know, so, so we're seeing little things kind of creep up for the gig economy, et cetera, mm. et cetera, kind of actually let's shape the technology that we want, which is a kind of pro-labor uh, thing, as it were, which I think would be really helpful. And then the other, just picking up on the Colin Mayer point, Colin's work through the British Academy to look at the future mm -hmm. of the corporation. And we've just put forward a kind of yeah, yeah. outline of how corporate regulation could shift to allow more purposeful business. Yeah. Uh, and actually, in a way, some businesses are leading the way, uh, but are being undercut by others who, who don't have to do that, as it were. So actually, if you could ma make this sort of more mm. central in corporate governance, that would be really positive. Yeah, I should have said that British Academy is doing very good work, actually, in that collaboration with Colin. Glenda, let's finish with you. What are some of the ways that policymakers and others can uh, respond to these challenges? Well, I think, as I said before, other learnings are important, so anything to do with reskilling and upskilling, particularly to address the inequalities that, um, that Chris was uh, discussing before, and also it goes with some, some of the elements on uh, well-being that we've heard before. But 
Unfortunately, what you see is that the low-skilled adults, the adults that are in those jobs that are at very high risk due to automation because many elements of those jobs could be easily uh, automated, those receive the least training. There's a gap of 20 percentage points between the high-skilled and the low-skilled in training. And even more concerning is that half of those don't even want to train. So, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, we were hearing before how feeling that there is a risk of, of losing your job is bad for your well-being. But a lot of those people don't see the risk. So they are not, uh, they don't see the risk uh, to their jobs. They don't see uh, the potential of reskilling, learning new things or transitioning to another job uh, to do for them. So I think this is an important message and there's many ways. I mean, uh, it, it would take a long time to, to, to indicate all the different uh, say other learning policies that will help on that, but uh, I think that's very important. It, would, it addresses the inequalities, allows people to keep jobs, but also to transition to jobs that are being created if their jobs are uh, doing that. Thank you, and thank you all the panellists. I think we'd like to move to questions now. We'll start off in the room. So there's a roving mic. Can you put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question and you're in your room at the front here. <coughs> Hi, um, uh, thank you. I'm Pedro Gomez. I'm a, a reader at, at Birkbeck University of London. Um, regarding the role of governments, there is uh, one uh, important policy that I think should be considered. It's in legislation, uh, legislation of working time. And uh, Vasily Leontiev, a Harvard uh, economist, uh, predecessor, uh, more than 30 years before uh, Chris on the, on the Nobel Hall of Fame, uh, he argued that historically it was always be, uh, used as a way to deal with the labor market disruptions of uh, new technology throughout the industrial revolutions, first from uh, reducing the working day from 12 to 10 hours and then to 8 hours and then the reduction of the working week from 6 to 5. And in the moment where so many companies are trialing the, the four-day week uh, with, uh, with some success, I think it's uh, one of the elements that uh, governments should consider. I hope you consider in your report as well. But I, I, I know that Chris already knew this. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? At the back. Yeah, two at the back. Three, Three at the back. Uh, hello there, Jude Hillary from the National Foundation for Educational Research, also uh, doing a Nuffield funded uh, review, uh, Future Skills um, uh, 2035. Um, I just reflecting on what you were talking about in terms of the role of policymakers and government more generally, I mean, I was surprised one of the things that you didn't mention, which is something I think about quite a lot, about um, the barriers that um, we have currently. Um, that um, uh, stop us from adopting innovation. And one of the things that I, I think a lot about, probably because of my background, is about the need to free up data much more in order so it can be exploited uh, more generally to take advantage of the um, uh, of things like automation and developing new AI in future. Um, I think that's something we as a, as a nation probably do need to think about a bit more. Um, I think... Uh, the last speaker, the remote speaker, was kind of touching on it as well. I think there's also an issue about sort of the, our sort of willingness as a nation to sort of embrace some of this sort of stuff. You're sort of looking at it from the perspective of risk, but I think there's also a wider conversation to be had about the opportunities all this stuff can bring and, and thinking about it from that perspective. Thank you. Should we do one more in the room, then we'll go remote? Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, hi, I'm Harry Farmer from the Aid Lovelace Institute. Um, so it's really picking up on a theme that I think kind of came out of a lot of the discussion over the past few minutes, um, really about that kind of connection between productivity and, and wages and living standards. And there being this kind of product, uh, this problem that I think a lot of people are alluding to where productivity itself is really, really difficult to redistribute. We know it's really unevenly balanced, but because of, on the one hand, agglomeration facts, uh, agglomeration facts, it's really difficult to redistribute ge geographically where productivity happens within the UK or within a country. 
And also it's really difficult to kind of redistribute it sectorally. Some sectors are a lot more productive than others. And typically the sectors which are most productive don't employ that many people. And I guess this is even more the case with automation. So I'm guessing my question I think is, given those two problems, I guess you have a couple of potential solutions. One of which is to try and just redistribute the gains from productivity, which is why I think there was loads of reference to transfer payments to the importance of the welfare state and the social safety net. And I guess the other thing that I think was alluded to was the idea that you just artificially make some of those other jobs which are less productive, either more productive, or you just artificially make them better paid and better respected. And I think this comes back to kind of this trope that you hear often about care work, for instance, being, you know, it, it being kind of one of the key industries of the future and it, it needs to receive kind of more money and more respect. Um, and I'm just really, really curious of those two options, given transfer payments, you know, have quite, quite a long history. And that's a lot of what characterized the settlement of the short 20th century. Is it politically viable to go back to that? And, and if not, do we have to kind of, yeah, artificially kind of inflate the value of, of other areas of the economy? And can that be done? You'd like to respond to that, Chris? Well, it's, I mean, is it feasible? Is it, 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 it would be a political decision. But I, I do think, though, that uh, transfers in the form of, um, of the provision of good quality services across the country is the, is the best leveling up we can hope of. So we level up on, on public services, but good quality public services, you know, a, a better national health service, uh, better schools, and, um, and the social safety nets and various networks for uh, jobs and you know how to find jobs, how to create vacancies and so on. I, I think that's essential given that uh, we want to take advantage of the agglomeration effects that uh, will always be there. Now, of course, the problem that is the problem that's been faced here, though, I think especially the problem in the UK, you know, you might ask why is, why is taxation so high and it looks like it will have to rise is that, um, I mean, it's basically down to the national health, less, less education than the national health, because n national health spending is what economists call a luxury. If there is a rise in income by X percent, then what, if it was a completely free economy, we would spend, we would increase our spending on health services by more than X percent. I mean, we see it in countries like the United States that, uh, that don't have restrictions. So you don't have as many restrictions as we have here. So if we are going to um, uh, fund the NHS in a way that uh, should be providing a good service and not a falling standard, then we have to be providing more and more tax revenue towards it. So it's, so it's basically unsustainable. But no politician, uh, ever confronts that issue. The, the way they confront the issue is by saying, make more economies and more economies, and in the end, standards fall. So I, so I don't know, you know, like, like where the Swedes, for example, provide good quality medical services, and, and they are sustainable in that their tax revenue isn't, isn't going up. But I think the, the way they do it is by having a, contribute, a contributory element, which of course would be completely unacceptable here given the uh, politics behind the NHS. Thanks, Chris. I'd really like to bring in our virtual yeah. audience. Uh, can we bring in, I think we've got a coordinator who's going to tell us who's Hello. Um, so, hi there. Thank you, um, everyone online, for raising your hands. We've got lots of questions. I'm going to go um, with first come, first served, and, and we'll see how we do. Um, first of all, could we hear from Nava Ashraf, please? Sure. Thanks. Um, uh, I'm from the uh, LSE Economics Department. Um, Chris, I was super intrigued by what you said regarding the, the idea that the adoption of automation and its impact is highly unequal, but that it could be mediated by um, knowledge sharing among employees and between employees and management and, and collaboration in that same way. And I was wondering 
um, what we know so far about that. What are, 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 do we have any kind of best practices for firms who are doing that? And I think it's related to what um, Glenda was talking about in terms of the, and, and I, I see that slightly differently, but it's the challenge of, of workers wanting to get the new skills. It may be that in fact, not that they don't believe that the industry is changing, but that actually the fear around how much they're going to be able to lose their jobs somewhat can create an avoidant tendency to not actually want to learn new skills. It's a pretty scary situation, and that's not amenable to the kind of pedagogical tools we use for training people well. So I think this knowledge sharing could be a solution to the skill building as well. But I'm curious what we know in terms of what are best practices for this. Well, uh, I mean, what I know is what I read. I've read a bit of the management literature, the um, various, you know, quality uh, publications where they write about engaging stakeholders, you know, like the Boston, Boston Consulting Group has some um, interesting articles and surveys on that. The Financial Times actually had, had one, it, they claimed three years ago that they were starting a diversity index. Well, there was. Has it, I don't think it's continued, though, or has it? I think there's, there's a diversity leaders index. Yes. Yes, yes it does continue. Oh, it's yeah. an annual thing. Yeah. Oh, I see. I missed the more recent. Yeah. I mean, and 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 they do talk a lot about who your stakeholders are, and the the interview. I mean, many of these interview workers, and they ask them how much involved them have they had in the operation of the firm, and. Um, then what at least what I saw in the Boston Consulting Group, which is uh, which was quite revealing actually, I, I quite like the study. That they took the answers that workers have given, and then they checked how much um, new research they are doing uh, R and D, how much uh, implementation of uh, the new technologies they are doing, and in fact, all the in, in all the cases where the workers were saying that they were asked by management and they were involved in decision making and all that, they were the they were the technological leaders as well mm. uh, in that. Whereas if it's done all secret and that, then there's a lot, a lot, there are a lot of uncertainties in the workforce. They are trying to see if they can leave and go somewhere else where there is more uh, job security and, and, and all that. That's the, uh, yeah, I've read yeah, I've read the management literature, but not the not big books. It's usually articles that I read. As I was saying. Thank <laughs> you. Can we have another? Remote Can question. We do indeed. Um, could we go to Francesca Valli, please? Thank you. Uh, my name is Francesca. I work in uh, global uh, projects of technology transformation. Thank you for the wonderful presentation and debate. Uh, I wanted a clarification from Professor Pisaridis about the automation technology your review will look at. Some of the images on the slides refer to head uh, robotics arms, so they refer to a manufacturing context. But now, apart from the collaboration and uh, uh, tec digital technologies, the, import, the critical thing is the automation of knowledge work. So I wanted the clarification of that. Thank yeah, you. I think, I think you're right that um, the, there isn't a precise definition of automation because it's changing all the time. And, and um, I mean, automation originally is, it, it started with, uh, with robots in that uh, th there are various tasks that are being done without human in interference. Uh, and once they are done by machines, then you're still being automated. <laughs> but that's a very sharp distinction that uh, even if it was true in the uh, early days of uh, robotics and uh, assembly lines and so on, it's no longer true, especially in the service sector and in management and all that, where you, where you might have artificial intelligence generating knowledge and making uh, decisions alongside human beings. So we, I, I don't think we're going to I mean, mainly because it's not feasible, I guess, but uh, also I don't see much benefit to define, to find, try and define very precisely what we mean by automation and, and see how much it has been applied. It's more, we're going to look at more generally how much uh, human input is being replaced by uh, capital, uh, by machinery, basically, in, the, in, in production. And then, of course, there you see how much output you are getting, how many workers are employed, and 
a serious residual, then you know how much capital is contributing and technology. At least that's how I see, I, I see it now in my mind. Thank you, Chris. I think we've got one time for one more remote question. In um, that case, could Richard Layard, could you um, share your question? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my boss. Ah. <laughs> oh, you're on. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Could we unmute Richard, please? Okay. Um, Chris, you, you didn't say much about pay, individual pay. Um, and, of course, we know that there's a huge issue of when people are working in teams, um, are they paid according to the productivity of the team or is there a forced ranking of individuals within teams? A lot of the well-being evidence is that the second is very destructive of, of well-being. Mm -hmm. But this leads me really to, to ask you two questions. I mean, first... Do we think that this automation is going to basically um, lead more and more people to be working in teams by, by eliminating almost all the jobs which have piecework pay at the moment? Um, therefore, this issue becomes even more acute. And, and second, what do you actually think yourself about the future of pay? Because if we're talking about well-being at work, the, the future systems of remuneration are really central. Hmm. Well, at least, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I would agree entirely uh, with that. Who am I to disagree with you about well-being, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know, actually. It's a very, it's a very, very difficult question. And I'm glad you've raised it because we, we didn't think about that. How, how, do you reward, how do you reward the individual members of a team when it's a collaborative effort. Why, why do you believe that um, with the new uh, machinery and automation and uh, all that, it's more likely that we have teams working rather than individuals? Well, I mean, the easiest jobs to, to automate are, are the ones which are, are, are done by one person producing you know, a certain measurable output. I would have thought those are the easiest to, to automate. Yes, yes. It's a very, I mean, it's both, it's, it's both a, very, a very interesting problem and a very difficult one because someone has to impose remuneration systems on a team which might have a leader. And of course, the leader will want to take the biggest share. And um, how are the others represented? We are, we are going back to, to unions, in fact, and, uh, and their uh, potential role in this. Could we bring Jolene in on, on the well-being yeah. point there? I don't think I could add anything to uh, what Lord Layard would say <laughs> on well-being. <laughs> uh, but I think we are... So it raises an important point because... Um, personal remuneration, group remuneration. I think really what, what the, the thread that's being, that's being pulled through a number of the questions and, and quite a bit of the discussion here is the individual versus the communitarian approach. You talked about kind of falsely pushing up the values of caring work. I'm not sure that's falsely pushing things up. I think actually the market will do that if there are shortages of workers. Uh, and to what extent, and the social welfare system is a communitarian approach to protect against individualism. I think we really are in a state of transition as, as a globe potentially pushed there by COVID, but in a state of transition and by the financial crisis about whether we want to review our communitarian view, our, uh, uh, it's, that's not the economic term, but I hope it's better understood, uh, versus the individualism and what that means, where, where automation sits within that as both a disruptor and a facilitator. I think we could probably talk all evening. And I, I know should. there is a reception outside for everyone who, here mm. who wants to carry on talking. And I believe the live chat's going to be left open for a little while for people online. So yes, we'll leave, um, sorry, we'll leave the live chat open um, for a little while for everyone to, to talk. But also, um, we're keeping a note of questions dropped in the chat um, so we can share that with the team later. So please do put your questions in. 
you. Thank you. Could I jump in with one final point? Final point. <laughs> it's just, I mean, I do want to end on this kind of notion that the economy is not something that that's out there that happens to us. We have a role in shaping it. And, you know, I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is the climate crisis. So we are going to have to manage a just transition. Uh, and what does the kind of net zero economy look like? And what's that economy that we want to collectively shape? So, you know, I, I think that's, that's really a very good. pertinent point to end on. Thank you. And I'm going to hand over to Anna to close the event. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel, and everybody for an amazing um, discussion from the shaping of innovation um, uh, automation technologies to knowledge sharing and information about it and the physical, social and legal infrastructure needed to help the transitions to a future of um, better work. Um, so thank you very much for that and thank you for joining us and also to my amazing in-house team, um, Dora, Hannah, Bertha, Matt, Abby, um, supporting the review. Um, uh, which is at the beginning of a, what's going to be a very exciting project. To find out more, um, do visit the new website, um, pissaridesreview.ifow.org, um, and get in touch if you have a professional or research interest in, uh, in the subjects or have insights to share. Um, do make sure you follow us uh, using the hashtag, um, hashtag <laughs> Review, um, and also uh, Future Work Inst. Um, and thank you very much for coming and thanks again to the Nuffield Foundation um, for hosting as well as supporting this uh, in project. I do let's continue the conversation um, over a drink. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So